I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Brewer Science with Darren Collins, who's going to talk today about defect reduction. Darren, one of the big problems as we get into most the most advanced nodes is we're starting to deal with defects. What are some of the problems that you're seeing? What's the cost of them? Well, a lot of the defects today come from the sub-supply chain, um, raw materials. They, they tend to uh, get overlooked a lot of times from some suppliers for semiconductor because they're not typical semiconductor suppliers in some cases. So what does, or we found is effective is that um, managing the supply chain and the sub-supply chain has been become, become critical uh, for the advanced nodes in particular. In not only working with the suppliers, um, but also working with the customers as well and understanding the impact of those uh, impurities or slight variations in some of these baseline uh, initiators or precursors has been found to be critical for controlling the quality and, and having yield improvements. So is this problem worse at the most advanced nodes? Is it different now than it was at, say, 40 nanometers? It's very different than 40 nanometer. Things we notice now in advanced nodes, you would not even uh, have detected um, at the customer side in particular at 40 nanometers. Now we're seeing these extremely small PPB or parts per trillion level contaminants that impact yield um, and lead to uh, defects at customer sites, especially on the advanced five and seven nanometer nodes. Why don't you draw this out for us? Okay, sure. So what are we looking at here? So what I've drawn here is that this is the uh, sub-supply base or the what we call crude in the industry. Uh, this is the uh, our supplier, direct suppliers. Uh, we typically have consolidate those down to two for business continuity purposes. Of course, this is the per uh, science, and then ultimately the end customer. So, if you can imagine the uh, the vastly diverse uh, supply, crude supply, just imagine that there there's a myriad of different processes and different ways they uh, supply our suppliers. So, what I've drawn here is how that they could feed um, in different ways our suppliers, and what's important is that you understand how their processes are different. So for example, I could you could look from a, pre, a purity standpoint, say this is 99.998, and then for simplicity I'll say 99.997, and then there are 9.998, 9.998, .99, obviously. And this is, a, this is a real world phenomenon that we were dealing with, um, with sub-supply crude suppliers because they're not they're not directly supplying a semiconductor customer typically so obviously what Brewer does is we work to understand a lot of times these are purity profiles and these can be you know these can be small part per billion level uh, trace contaminants that we would identify and understand how that trickles into our sub our supply chain and how that impacts the customer and your suppliers are based where are they all over the globe are they in specific areas uh, they're typically, yeah, they're typically global suppliers. And so now you have to manage what a, what amounts to a global supply chain for parts per billion and parts per trillion? That's correct. And if something goes wrong at 7 nanometers or 5 nanometers, what does that look like versus what it did at 40 nanometers? Well, at 40 nanometers, typically you would go do an analysis of the vendor C of A. You would look at uh, our, our QC data. So what we do mm -hmm. is we characterize the materials early on in the process, during the development process, and you look at these impurity profiles so that if you do, at say five or seven nanometer, have, a, have an, uh, an issue, you can go back and you can start looking at these profiles and to see, now you can uh, take the uh, end customer's process and align it back to these purity profiles. And if you see something that's, that's small in these, these parts per trillion level or part per billion level, you can now uh, match that to the customer's uh, performance problem. You're also dealing with processes now that are very specific for individual foundries. Does that change in terms of you now have variation that may be specific to one? Uh, you may have a process where one chemical may, may matter to one and not to another? That's correct. That's a, that's a great point. Every customer is different, and that, that's an important part about collaboration. It's not just with the supply base and the sub-suppliers, the collaboration is also on the customer side. If we can see hundreds of different variants in our sub-supply chain, and the impact to the, to the customer's processes is important, and it's extremely important to have that collaboration. And we typically see uh, a, 
when there's good collaboration, there's a more robust process, product delivered because of that collaboration and that work together. So foundries typically have been reluctant to share this kind of information with their suppliers. Is that changing? I think the foundries are realizing that it has to change. Um, in other industries, um, I think I've even heard in some of the semi conferences that they're starting to acknowledge that the collaboration has to change in order for the, the supply base to uh, advance to use, or support their advanced nodes. One of the big changes as we get down into 7.5 is the, the insertion of EUV. How does that affect materials? <clears throat> the experience with the KRF and ARF materials is pretty uh, broad, so we have a lot of experience in that area. EUV's newer, um, but the I think the approach to how you manage the subsupply is the same. Um, you really look for those inconsistencies. You really try to understand and collaborate with the customer on what the impact of their process based on those inconsistencies. And then, uh, again, you work with the supplier so they understand your requirements. So I think EUV is new, and we're probably, there's a lot to learn. The learning curve is steep. But with respect to how you approach the supply chain and the quality aspects of it, I think the approach and the culture, the mindset of quality is the same. What's been the reaction of the customers to this? Overall, the customers are extremely supportive. As a matter of fact, they, they, their expectations are that the supply chain do this. Now, this is one aspect of a whole material characterization approach um, that we've applied that's been successful and um, the feedback has been phenomenal. How about the reaction from the suppliers? Are they <laughs> complaining about this or no? So the supplier reacts is a little bit different than the customer. Um, and it really is it's supplier dependent. If the supplier is uh, reluctant then, or doesn't think that this is necessary, then you're not going to be a supplier in the, advanced, in the semiconductor space. So that's, you, you just can't survive. Are you finding because of that that the supplier base is uh, starting to consolidate? Um, I don't, consolidate may not be the, uh, the word I would use, but you are seeing that it's, it's necessary to rely on suppliers that have that mindset. So a lot of times what you'll find is you can put, you know, a purification house in between these suppliers that understands the concepts so that they can deliver more consistent material. So shrinking uh, features is only one direction that we're going in. The other direction that we're also heading in is to package different uh, dyes together, chiplets, uh, into advanced packaging. What happens on the materials there? It seems <clears throat> the concept's the same for consistency, but definitely the impact to the process is very different. Um, if you're looking at you know, the front end or the lithography side of things versus you know, the, the wafer level packaging, it's certainly, it, it's certainly a different approach with respect to the end side of things, but from a quality perspective, again, I go back to that mindset, that quality uh, cultural mindset that drives the supply base. It's still, the, it's, it's still the same. Really understanding the impact of the customer and the collaboration is where it's very different. And even in, in the lithos, you know, on the front end, when you're dealing with customers, the, the processes are different, just like uh, wafer level packaging. So, so it, once again, it's, it's the uh, collaboration with the customer. And the more we understand what they need from us, the better we can prepare our suppliers. One other thing that's changed here is some of the markets that some of these chips are going into automotive, uh, industrial IoT have never existed before. They have much higher standards for reliability and quality and, and much longer, uh, the chips will be in the market much longer than they have been in the past. What happens here? How does this affect it? I think I don't think there's any impact here because again you're striving for the highest quality regardless of the application. Um, so really, as far as the robustness, again, that's that's uh, that really relies on the customer's feedback to us and what their requirements are. Um, but again, even without those requirements, th this approach has proven to be uh, a good, a strategic approach to quality control with respect to the supply base. Darren Collins, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome.